Great. And yeah, so my name is actually Lauren Stovall, and I'm the head of nonprofit programs here at AWS, which includes our amazing TechSoup program and partnership with TechSoup. And we have been working with nonprofits for over 15 years, which is as long as AWS and the cloud has really been around. And that's with organizations of all sizes and all mission areas. And what we really focus on is helping nonprofits transform how they achieve their missions. And so I want to take a step back and talk a little bit for those new at, up to AWS in the cloud, what AWS is. So the, the kind of talk track is that we're the most comprehensive and broadly adopted cloud platform that includes 200 fully featured services and data centers around the world globally, whichever way you want to look at it. But what that really means is that you're accessing compute and storage and other capabilities over the internet in a way that allows you to be hyper-efficient in how you're consuming types of technology and infrastructure so that you don't have to build it and maintain it yourself. So probably a lot of your organizations have maybe servers in a closet in your office or have built your own data center somewhere and you have to maintain that and plan for use and the hardware and all of that kind of stuff. And what AWS does is take that element out of it. And you actually then consume using AWS services in most cases as a utility, like you would water or gas or anything like that. So you're paying for what you use as opposed to paying for it all up front. And one thing that I think is always really helpful or interesting is that the way AWS actually came to be is through amazon.com. So amazon.com, as you can imagine, it is a massive um, global web platform and getting bigger every day. And so they needed a massive amount of data centers to operate that for the peak of performance, which is the holiday season. And so they built this massive infrastructure, but they weren't using it except for around the holiday season when orders went, of course, through the roof. And they realized, wait a second, this could be shared and everyone could get economies of scale and efficiency and price and cost if we shared the infrastructure that we've built for our business. And so that's actually how AWS was formed. And that's now what it is and growing every day and what's, what's possible. Um, I would say, you know, for smaller organizations, generally where they start with AWS is things like storage, making sure that your data is not on someone's computer who might leave or it might get lost, storing that data somewhere where you can have, of course, security and access controls and all of that stuff, but in a way that's hyper resilient and you won't lose it. Um, and it's always safe and accessible. And then once it's there in the cloud stored, there's all kinds of things you can do with it. Analytics, machine learning, all of that kind of great stuff. And then the other thing, and I'll come back to data in a second, is compute power. So compute is what allows you to run your website, for example. Um, and that can be you know, a static website or a very large web application that your beneficiaries, for example, use to engage with you, donors that use to donate or find out information about your organization. And so compute is really the home of the digital experience, as well as the back end of a lot of this data processing, which I told you I was going to come back to. And so that compute power that you can access, again, when you need it and turn it off when you don't, um, is what underlies what a lot of what we're going to, all of what we're going to talk about today, which is artificial intelligence and ultimately Gen AI, which I know everyone is really, really excited about. And that's what we're going to focus on today. But really, at the end of the day, with transformation, whether you're using AI or analytics or just basic business intelligence, which is QuickSight is our service for that, uh, data is actually a massive asset. And a lot of organizations, I think, look at data as a byproduct, um, sometimes an unruly byproduct. And the reality is that data is actually an asset, a massive organizational asset. And we want to work with nonprofits to look at the data they have understand what they have visibility into and what they don't, and really how to harness that data to have better insight and better decision making. And so what we really focus on is encouraging data literacy in nonprofit organizations. What data do you have? What formats? What can it tell you? And then looking at ways to create cultures around data, making sure that when you're making decisions, you're bringing data to the forefront of that, whether it's on the cloud or not, really to establish that culture of we're going to do this for this reason, but it needs to be supported by data. Opinions are great. We all have them, but it's also really important to, to look at it something objectively 
and to measure also objectively on the other side to know if something's working or not to further increase your decision making and that decision making can be anything from a programmatic decision you're making it could be a decision about how to make more efficient efficient processes in your organization it could be using the data to target donors and see how you can give them more personalized preferences to create their, that connection with your organization and at the end of the day you can start small it's really about testing and learning and thinking about how to bring data into your everyday life as you go about doing what is the most important thing in all of this which is advancing your mission and going from outputs to from to outcomes to ultimately impact and data is also a key to that right to be able to understand longitudinally over time what is the impact your organization is having and so we have a ton of programs also to help nonprofits kind of go on this cloud journey we understand it can seem overwhelming at times on where to start and so we have a ton of different programs to be able to support that and that's everything of course from our aws uh, nonprofit credit program that we have with TechSoup, where you can get credits to underwrite the cost of some of your use of AWS annually. So every year you can come back and access credits and it'll generally um, cover a lot of your foundational infrastructure, like your website, for example, or some storage. We also have an AWS nonprofit partner network, which is great and growing all the time. Same thing with Marketplace. So an AWS nonprofit marketplace, this is relatively new, but what it is, is basically a, a shop, for lack of a better word, to go and acquire software and other platforms. But the great thing about when you use Marketplace is that it aggregates it in one bill with your other AWS spend, maybe where your website's running. And so you're all doing it in a way where everything is aggregated together and you don't have all of these costs kind of all over the place. It really streamlines it in one place. And then of course, there's all kinds of great tools to explore there. The other thing is our AWS Imagine Grant. So that is our annual grant program, it is a cash grant program. The cycle just ended for this year, but it'll be open again next year. So you can start thinking about your projects, but there are two categories, momentum to modernize for those just getting started and go further faster. Those are really taking it to the next level in cloud and innovating with things like machine learning algorithms, for example. And then we also have an annual conference. So the Imagine Nonprofit Conference that's in DC. Well, it's moved around, but it'll be in DC again this year as it was last year. And we hope that those that are around can attend or get the opportunity to travel to visit with us. Though all of that is available on demand after the conference and is now from our last conference in March of 2023. Uh, it'll be a similar time this year and so we'll keep everyone posted but really recommend going and checking that on demand content out it'll definitely give you an even deeper sense of how nonprofits are leveraging the cloud and then finally um, the aws powering purpose in the cloud guide so this is based on extensive research as well as data from our imagine grant program that really showcases the state of cloud adoption in the nonprofit space but what it also does is share you can benchmark where your organization is in your cloud adoption journey. You can see again how other organizations are leveraging the cloud and the types of solutions that could be very valuable based on your organization's goals. And so we have a QR code there. You can take a second to scan it. Um, again, through that, you can get the benchmarking tool and the guide. Spoiler alert, it's very long. It's like 60 something pages, but it is also very, very, very comprehensive. And I think thought provoking to help organizations even begin to start talking about what are we doing with our data? What are we doing to leverage digital to reach more audiences or enhance the services that we're providing through our programs? And so we would love for you to take a look at that and certainly reach out to us on any of these things if we can help you move further uh, in your cloud journey and the work that you're doing on behalf of your mission. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to the star of the show, Evo, to talk about what's possible with, you guessed it, Gen AI. Hey, uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, oh, can everybody hear me? I think so, yes, perfect. Hey, so um, appreciate that. Um, so like Lauren said, if you don't know much about AWS, you probably know that we're a cloud hosting service, um, uh, hosting a company's websites, uh, hosting your data, hosting your business processes, right? So, but we do way more than that. So uh, compute and just your virtual machines is one, but today what I really wanna do is, is kind of pique your interest and try to, uh, have you think beyond just using um, uh, computers as, as a virtual machine and think what else is possible, right? So let's dive into a little bit here. So what do these images all 
have in common. So they look like typical photos of dogs and food and mountains, but actually all these images were uh, artificially created or generated. And they were created with a new form of artificial intelligence that we call generative AI. And so today what I wanna do is talk to you about generative AI about kind of a state of the industry and how Amazon can help you use these new technologies to drive your nonprofits forward. So my name is Ivo Jensen. Um, I'm a solution architect here at AWS. I'm in the nonprofits team. And like I said, it's gonna be fun. So today, um, let me click on the right button here. There we go. So what we're gonna talk about today is what is generative AI and how can we use this for your nonprofit? And then once we establish why this is going to be useful for you, we're gonna talk how we can meet that demand for you. And I'm gonna end this with a little cool demo uh, that you might find interesting as well. So generative AI is a new type of artificial intelligence that can create new content, new ideas, like conversations, stories, images, videos, music, and it's, it's powered by large machine learning models that are pre-trained on enormous amounts of data, like internet scale data, with a thing that we call foundational mod, uh, foundation models. And we've seen a revolution in this field over the past couple of years, especially in the past six months. I'm sure you've heard of ChatGPT. It is everywhere, right? I'm sure you, you might also have heard of tools like Midjourney, Stable Diffusion. These are some of these generative AI solutions that um, can generate images from just text prompts. Um, so this is not really that new though. ChatGPT, Stable Diffusion, they are now new public models and really have brought this to the public. But to be honest, AWS has been doing generative AI for years. For instance, this type of machine learning, this type of AI, that's really what powers the search results on amazon.com. And it also powers Alexa to create that human-like conversational experience, right? So over time, these models become better and better to, to fine tune into your needs. And especially in the terms of Alexa to really become this conversational-like interface with you that goes way beyond the chatbots that you had maybe 10 years ago. So I'm gonna do a little bit technical here, but then I'm gonna bring it back into why this is useful for um, machine uh, for, for nonprofits. Um, machine learning has been around for a long time. And with traditional machine learning models, you need to do a lot of work to actually make it work for you. You would, for instance, have to train your data with like label data. So for instance, if you wanna build some artificial intelligence that can recognize houses, you have to feed it hundreds of thousands of images of houses. And after that, it starts recognizing other houses. Or what you can do is you can give it a whole bunch of existing shopping data, like we do on amazon.com, like, hey, people who bought like, you know, uh, um, batteries also bought flashlights, right? And over time, these models learn to correlate those two and then kind of recommend um, purchases for, um, for shopping carts. Now with foundation models, this new type of AI, instead of gathering label data for each model, which is very inten uh, labor intensive, we're using unlabeled data. Basically what we do is we throw the internet at these models um, and basically let them learn on their own, right? This is kind of like that neural artificial intelligence. So this is what ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion do. So these are these giant public models that allow you to, to basically lean on the knowledge of the internet and then generate net new things, net new text, net new code, net new uh, recipes or images, right? So the cool thing about these foundation models though is that we can adapt them for specific use cases. And this is where you have to start thinking, how can this apply to my company, right? We can adapt these models so they can be customized to perform very specific functions that are unique to your business. And that you can actually do with very small amounts of data. So this is kind of that, that, that shift that has happened over the past 12 months to make machine learning and artificial intelligence really um, uh, reachable to smaller companies and, and the public at large. 
So what are these general uh, use cases for generative AI? Uh, uh, some of these use cases, again, were already possible with uh, the machine learning of the past 10 years, and now they're completely improved with this new type of generative AI. So let's think about chatbots, right? You've had chatbots when you chat with your airline or with your bank, uh, they've been kind of clunky. Um, generative AI really is transforming the space with much, much better interactive capabilities. So it just sounds like you're talking to a real person, right? You can see it in the, the evolution if you have an Alexa or maybe one of our competitor devices even at home. Um, it talks back to you like it, like it becomes more and more lifelike over time. Um, so those are customer experience enhancements. Um, it can help customers boost um, uh, employee productivity with like search, content creation, summarization, et cetera. And we can even improve your business operations with like document processing, productive maintenance, quality control, that kind of stuff. So let's dig a little bit deeper onto how this can help nonprofits. And here's just a tip of the iceberg on how nonprofits could leverage generative AI. And really the purpose of this slide is, is to get you thinking on how you could leverage this new technology, right? So here are just a few examples. Let's think about fundraising. Like these language generation models like ChatGPT can be used to generate qualification emails, thank you letters, or even generate new proposals. Um, member interaction, you can improve your customer service. Uh, think about, again, like these chatbots of, of the past, they are now completely overhauled, become much more interactive and much more smart about your business. Um, grant writing, um, you can use these, these text generation models to draft grant applications, project proposals, using data and text from your database of, of, of grants. A search uh, uh, companies, especially nonprofits, they often have a huge knowledge base of data, a lot of customer data. So let's think on how you can connect this new technology to your existing CRMs and other systems of records to, to search across your knowledge base. Uh, content creation, um, there's a couple of public AI platforms that can turn blog posts and written content into videos automatically. So that's new. Uh, there's Lumen5, Synthesis, that AI, those are some of the public companies that help you with this. Um, we have tools that can create uh, um, a, a targeted fundraising emails, like I said, uh, volunteer management. Um, so we can use this, this predictive uh, aspect of, of AI to help you identify and engage volunteers uh, match them with opportunities, track their progress, et cetera. And one that I think is pretty cool is, is, is outreach. Um, uh, um, uh, sorry, multimedia. Uh, I think it's actually happening right now where there's closed captioning that you can turn on on a Zoom call right now. So that's a type of artificial intelligence where it picks up your voice and helps summarize video or transcribe video to make them more accessible. So really what I want you to do is to think about all these things that are possible, right? So here at AWS, we're all about what we call the art of the possible. And we'd love to hear from you what kind of use cases you can come up for this new technology. Just a real quick example here. Um, uh, like I said, a transcript summarization or article summarization for, for grant writing. This is some uh, stuff that uh, our partners Cohere and AI21 do. Um, Wartoon is a cool tool that actually helps you improve your writing by making it more engaging. Um, image generation, this is kind of what Stable Diffusion does. This is actually an example by Stable Diffusion 2.0. Um, this living room that you see, doesn't actually exist. It's completely computer generated, right? You can think also about taking two different concepts like a human face and a VR glasses, and then actually ask the model, ask this AI, can you combine those two and actually give me a human face with a VR goggle? And sure enough, AI can do that. So we're not new to this. Um, 
we have here at AWS have been doing machine learning and have been taking this to our customers and making it easier for our customers to do for uh, the better part of a decade now. We have over 100,000 customers uh, using AWS for machine learning alone, including many, many uh, nonprofits. Cool. So I think at this point, it's clear that this is going to be useful. This is going to be transformative for the industry, for all industries, including the nonprofit industry, right? And we've seen these public models, ChatGPT, Stable Diffusion, that are out there that anybody can use. You can download an app. Um, you can log into a Discord server and start creating these images. Um, but think of this, right? All that data is publicly available. And there's challenges on how to apply that to your specific um, specific company. So there's a lot of privacy concerns. And I know there's questions in the chat, so I'm going to address those right now. There's privacy concerns about feeding your data to these public models like ChatGPT, right? Because think about it. These public services will learn from your IP that you're typing into it and actually might give it back to other customers. And you really want to avoid using these public models from for your targeted enterprise um, uh, enterprise applications. Second, you also need to customize these models with your company data. What good is a chat GPT if, it, uh, if you have it on your website, but it cannot actually answer the FAQ for your specific company, right? And all this has to be done in a secure way and in a cost-effective manner. So let's see how AWS specifically can help you Take this concept of generative AI and make it make it applicable to your company. So, um, first of all, how do you even get started, right? I mean, I know that some of you are new to AWS. Uh, there's probably some of you that have only seen ChatGPT uh, in the news. So, how do you get started with that, right? So, we actually made this available to you. So what we have done is we have curated a selection of these foundation models, as they are called, from AI21, from Anthropic, from Stability AI, and even some of our own models. And we make those available to you through our AWS services. And we'll dive a little bit deeper on how we do that, right? Second, you need to customize it, right? So it's, it's one thing that you um, have access to these, these models in a, in a secure and private way, but then you need it to be easy to take this base foundation model and then build these different differentiated apps on top of it that use your own data. And again, your data is your IP. So it needs to stay secure, protected and private during the whole process. You need to be able to, to be in control of your data so you know it remains private and confidential, right? So, and we do that. So if you know a little bit of AWS, each little what we call virtual private cloud within AWS is completely private to you. You might be running on a, on a rack and some data server right next to like your bank or next to Netflix, but we have segregated this. Um, the government uses it as well. So you can trust it's secure. Um, any data that you store in your virtual private cloud will remain there and will not be shared across any other customers. And that's really important. Cost effective. Um, basically, everything we do at AWS is pay as you go. Uh, you use something uh, in AWS and when you're done with it, you can turn it off and your cost goes all the way down to zero, right? So you don't have to pay or get locked into upfront contracts. You go like, hey, I need a virtual machine for the next month or I need this Gen AI model for the next five minutes and you get billed per second, basically. So that's how we do pay as you go. We even developed our own chips, um, our own uh, graphical chips um, to make it even more cost-effective to you. Okay, so you need to be able to use this quickly, right? So like I said in the first bullet point in flexibility, we make these things available to you. And how do you even get started to using those? So we have a number of different services that are called Amazon SageMaker. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Amazon Bedrock, which is a new service for Gen AI. Um, these services allow you with very minimal coding, sometimes even no coding, 
to implement these generative AI solutions into your websites and into your business processes. Talked about no coding solutions. So what we do here at, at Amazon is we start building, taking these, these, these bits and building blocks and bits and pieces and we make them available to you in a completely managed way. We already do this with uh, OCR document scanning, with text to speech, speech to text. Um, now we have a new service completely built on uh, generative AI called Code Whisperer. So if you're a development shop building code, um, I'll show you a little bit demo of this in a little bit later, um, it can actually write code for you. This is, this is crazy how easy it is. Okay, so um, for those of you that do know about uh, AWS and the services, this is the net new that we've announced for this year within the context of generative AI. We have uh, two new services, well, really one new service, one was there already a little bit. So uh, Amazon Bedrock is a completely new service that makes it super easy to you to build and scale new generative AI solutions with these foundation models from our partners. Um, and as an Amazon uh, SageMaker Jumpstart, um, which uh, allows you to basically take these, mo um, these models and modify them for your specific uh, use case. I'm gonna show you a little demo of SageMaker Jumpstart in just a little bit. Um, let's see, uh, special, specialized uh, uh, chips. I'm gonna jump over them. It's really cool. We have cool technology. Um, and Amazon Code Whisperer is this new managed service that allows you to help build your applications and your mobile apps faster. Okay, let's dive a little bit into each of these before I dive into my demo. Um, SageMaker Jumpstart, it's um, a, a, a tool and you'll see it in, um, in, in live in action in just a few minutes. Uh, you get full control over your infrastructure. You can full control of which foundation model you want to use how you want to customize it. So it's, it's, it's quite easy to use. Um, we have a long list of publicly available foundation models that you can use uh, and run and customize, and then eventually also deploy uh, into production into your, into your ecosystem. Lots of different models. We have proprietary models, publicly available models. Uh, the proprietary models are uh, 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 they cost a little bit more, um, but they're super accurate. Um, and that's why that's why they, they charge a little bit for them. Uh, but even the publicly available model, they still offer complete visibility and control over all the parameters, and you can still customize this as well. So SageMaker Jumpstart, you'll see in a second, it's a little bit. Um, uh, if you're not used to coding, this might be a little bit of a lift. Uh, for those of you that are a little bit familiar with, uh, with writing code, you'll see how easy it is to generate, um, to, to use these, these foundation models. Then we have a new service in preview uh, called Bedrock, which is going to make it even easier to use generative AI. It's completely serverless. So no worrying about CPUs or virtual machines or CPU hours and, and costs like that. You really just pay uh, per API call. Um, so with Bedrock's serverless experience, you can easily find that right model, easily customize it, uh, again, privately and securely with your own data and then integrate and deploy it into your applications that you also have running on AWS, like on a web server or on a database or something like that. Like I said, we uh, have partnered with uh, top AI startups to bring these foundation models to you in an easy way from AI21 and Tropic Stability AI, um, and even ourselves. So even Amazon, uh, we've built our own foundation model um, that uh, basically based on 20 plus years of our own experience with, for instance, Amazon.com search or, or Alexa. And then Amazon Code Whisperer. This is just a really cool application for, um, for completely managed uh, a generative AI. There's no customization needed. So what we've basically done is an AI coding companion. It helps you quickly write secure code by generating full function code suggestions in your favorite IDE in real time based on, this, on commands, right? So I just type in my code like, hey, I need to parse the CSV string. Um, and turn a list, but ignore the list, and you type enter and hop. 
Amazon Code Whisperer actually outputs all this code right for you. This is really powerful stuff. You might have actually seen this if you're into coding, that um, this is something that we do, uh, that, that ChatGPT can do as well. But again, think about it, right? ChatGPT, that is a public service and got its training from the internet. And as we know, the internet isn't always right. So the results you get back are not always right either. So what we did with Code Whisperer is train it on specifically curated code to make sure that we get really high quality code back. Cool. So I talked a lot. So what I talked about is basically um, what is generative AI, right? We, we had code generation, we had text to text, we had text to image, and we showed how you can apply this to uh, your start, uh, nonprofit in a, in a secure and cost-effective way. So I want to kind of give you a little demo of, of SageMaker Jumpstart and, and show you how easy it is um, to do that. So I'm going to switch to the console here. So if you've not logged into Amazon, then just go along for the ride and enjoy. If you have logged into AWS before, um, then this might look familiar for you, right? So um, in the console, so what I'm going to do here is go to Amazon SageMaker. So you can see a lot of different services here, EC2. Those are virtual machines, but most people think of and they think cloud computing. Um, uh, that's other uh, things, storage, S3, but I'm going to go to Amazon SageMaker here. And so what you see on the left is also a jump stop at the foundation model. So click on that. So right here in our console, you see all the foundation models that we have partnered with and that are available to you inside um, Amazon SageMaker. There's Hugging Face Text Generator. There's um, some GPT stuff as well. Um, and all the way at the bottom here is a stable diffusion. So stable diffusion is that um, um, text to image generating a, a tool. Let's click on view model here. Shows you the ULA. And so really what this does is once you click on open notebook and studio, uh, this takes a few minutes. So what I've done is instead of clicking on here, I'm gonna switch to this new tab where this is already opened. And so what this gives you is a playground to play with this model, to kind of try it out, to customize it even. So what this whole, it's basically a tutorial, it's a lab, right? So it goes through all the steps you need to do to, um, to get this model up and running, again, in your own virtual private cloud. So nobody else has access to this particular one because it's all yours. And then we'll show you how you can customize this. Um, if you're new to coding, this is uh, a lot of Python code. Um, this is why we came up with Amazon Bedrock, which actually makes this a lot easier. And Amazon Bedrock, I don't have a demo for that now, but it's in preview right now. Um, so basically, it's, it's really a tutorial. So you can follow along um, and, and really all the coding has been done for you. You just have to click on, yeah, let's do this, let's do this. Um, and really what it does all the way at the end is build um, that, 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 image generation interface all the way in your own um, in your own account. So this is completely done in my own sandbox. Again, nothing um, anywhere else is not public, it's just for me. But once I'm done with this, I can type prompts like, draw me a cottage in impressionist style. And sure enough, the computer now builds this because the computer being trained, the model being trained on this internet scale data knows what a cottage is, right? And knows, what impressionist style is. So this is a net new image completely generated by, um, by a computer. So, so far, this is possible out on the public internet as well, right? So you can actually go to, um, to Stable Diffusion's website, uh, sign up for a free account, log in and start generating these images yourself. But like I said, anytime you generate an image, that gets, that's a public image. Other people can see it too. Uh, and now all the prompts you give it, uh, the model kind of learns from that as well. So that is not your private data. So what I want to show you now is how you can take this stuff and customize it with just your data. As an example, what I did here is I took a couple of pictures of a, of a dog. 
dog is called Doppler. It's very cute. But this is a, this is a dog that the, that the model doesn't know yet about, right? These are this is this is not these are not public images uh, of the dog that the model knows about. This is a, a completely separate dog. His name is Doppler, and basically what I have is about let's say you know twenty or so pictures of Doppler. So very cute. So now the question is, how can we take uh, this giantly trained model that took like a year to make, and how can we make it so it now knows about Doppler, so it can start actually giving us net new image generation to just Doppler, right? So I have these pictures, a little bit of a, a, a little, uh, uh, some metadata here that says, hey, this dog is called Doppler, and yes, it is actually a dog. And so when I have all these files in my directory, what I do is I upload them, um, scroll down a little bit here. So what I do is I basically upload them to Amazon. So I upload them to S3. S3 is um, our um, uh, uh, storage uh, within AWS. So everything that we that you store, websites, uh, data, et cetera, all goes into S3. So I put that in there. And again, you can upload your own images as well, right? Um, uh, but I chose the, these pictures of Doppler right here. And then what you do is you basically train the model on a um, uh, uh, on this differential data, and we call it transfer learning. So uh, again, all the code is right here for you. you. Just execute it. If you want to try this, let's talk about cost for just a second, right? How much does this cost? So you only pay for what you use. So the model is already pre-trained. We actually make that available to you uh, at no charge. If you want to do this additional incremental learning, you'd have to pay for the... Um, the, the time that you use these, these CPUs to train it. 20 pictures uh, takes about maybe like an hour or so for this, for, for this to learn about this dog. About one and a half hour, I think uh, I, I did yesterday to train this model. Um, the CPUs that we use are about, let's say $3 an hour. So let's say, say it costs about $5 in total to, um, to teach this model on how to uh, think about this dog. So ran last night, and now it's now it's ready to go. So now I can actually give it a new prompt and go like, hey, I want a photo of Doppler, but now with a hat. If you think about it, right, nobody, um, uh, none of the pictures I had, actually the dog had a hat. So what if I just have the model do this? It takes about 10 seconds to generate. There you go. So this is a completely newly generated picture um, of that dog. It does look like him, right? And now it has a head. So this is a completely new picture. And it, the model is trained on my private data, which is completely different from um, using these public stable diffusion services on the web. Uh, I could do something else. This is, a, this is a, a red hat. Can I do a, let's see, can I do a yellow hat? Let's try something else. Live, always dangerous if you do a demo live. There you go, now it's a yellow hat, right? Maybe I want him on the beach. It's about 10 seconds. And so the system, uh, the cost of this, by the way, so again, think about it, right? This takes about 10 seconds to generate. Like I said, the CPU that Amazon, that Alias charges you to, to do this is about $3 an hour. Um, so think about how much it costs to do 10 seconds of image generation. There we go. Now we have Doppler, our, our trusty dog with a yellow hat on the beach. If you want more example, I actually want a Picasso uh, style painting instead of a picture. Right, let's see if we can do that. So again, each, each generation here is literally pennies, right? There you go. Isn't that cool? So um, the, the, the model, Stable Diffusion, already knew about Picasso, already knew about the style of Picasso, but we just taught it uh, um, with this transfer learning uh, about my dog Doppler, and now it can actually make Picasso-style paintings of Doppler on the beach with a yellow hat. Okay, so let's, let's go back to our slides and let's see what we've learned here. So what have we learned here, 
right? So this is SageMaker Jumpstart. So we used a pre-trained foundation model, in this case, Stable Diffusion, which already knew a lot about the world. It knew what a beach looked like, it knew what a dog looked like, it knew what a, a hat looked like, but it didn't know Doppler. Um, with SageMaker, you code in Python and you pay for CPU used by the second. So again, took about like maybe like $5 to teach it about my dog. Uh, and then it takes literally pennies for 10 seconds of image generation. Amazon Bedrock is a new service that is in preview right now. So if you're interested in that, we'll have some QR codes on the screen in just a second to teach you about, um, uh, about new uh, services. It will be serverless. There will be a lot less Python coding. Um, and the way that you pay for it is, is basically by API call rather than by um, uh, um, having to think about CPUs and stuff like that. And it's customizable with your own data, right? And that's so important for, for you as, as, a, as a company. How can I do this um, targeted for my use cases while I retain control of my data? This is a graphical example because I thought it would make a nice demo with a cute dog, right? Um, but think about the use cases that you can also do, right? Earlier we talked about um, we, we talked about uh, grant writing, right? So if you have a database of of, um, of proposals, uh, you can feed that into these text models, these chat GPT like models, and actually start building net new content trained on your data. Um, but then uh, for your purpose only based on that data. Uh, you can train it on your customer database. You can train it on your, um, on your FAQs, et cetera. And all of this is based you go pricing. I think I mentioned that, right? So um, right after this demo, I'm gonna shut everything down and my cost from that point on will be literally zero. So this whole demo basically, uh, the, the full price of this was maybe like a few dollars. You can try it yourself. If you're used to Amazon, uh, go to the console, go to the SageMaker Jumpstart and pick the stable Diffusion 2.1 model. Um, it will actually um, uh, like populate your, your editor with all that code. You don't have to know Python. You can just click through it and you can see all kinds of examples of auto-generated images and you can upload your own images as well and see um, how, how you can customize these models for your particular use case. Cool. So um, that kind of concludes the demo. I'm going to have some, some links here. Um, these slides will also be available on the TechSoup website starting, I believe, tomorrow. So if you don't have a chance to uh, snap all the QR codes right now, the slides will be on, um, on TechSoup and on YouTube pretty soon for you to, to, uh, to see them again. And so with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you. Um, it was my pleasure to demo this to you. I hope you had a, uh, it was informative um, and uh, let's start thinking on how you can use this for your use case. Thanks Evo. And we do actually have some questions if you don't mind. Not at all. All right. The first one is from Tom and his question is regarding stable diffusion and image creating with AI, how are copyright and the artist rights being considered in the images we create? Is it safe for our organizations to use images created with generative AI? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so in the, do I still have that up? I think here in the foundation model, if you click on view model, I've already had it somewhere here, right? So the EULA is right there. Um, I'll be very honest. I have not read through the whole EULA myself, but we do provide with each model exactly what kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, requirements there are of using the generated images from here. So to be honest, I have not read, read through the whole ULA, so I don't have a specific answer to your question, but what I was going to say is uh, you can probably find these answers in the ULA that we provide with each model. Okay, and then Brittany had a question to add to Tom's, which is, we have been using AI to generate news articles and other marketing materials. We have not been citing the AIs we use. Should we be giving credit to the AI program we use? Yeah, I think that's uh, going to be the same answer. I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a technical guy who knows how to make uh, uh, cute pictures of dogs. 
Um, but um, I, I would say let's read through the EULA on exactly what the copyright implications are. And I, I, to be honest, I'll, I'll go read through that later myself and maybe I'll learn something for the next time. Okay, this one's from Anonymous. Regarding the use of large language models or LLMs, how protected is our personally identifiable information for our participants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's exactly what, you've, what we've shown here today, right? So basically what you end up doing is you're uh, spinning up a copy of that model into your own account. So think about it this way. Your data is already safe in your own VPC, your virtual private cloud, and you're bringing the model to the data. Uh, whereas on the public, you take your data to the model on the internet. So really by having your data already private and then running that model, the LLM, inside your own account, none of the data that you have will be sent back or used to, to further train the original base model. It all stays local through this concept of transfer learning. And then someone asked, and if you have something, Evo, great, I'll, I can answer it to start. It says, can you share some reference accounts that nonprofits of nonprofits that are using generative AI today? The short answer is that generative AI is relatively new on the scene. We have a number of organizations that are not yet in terms of that use case and story uh, referenceable. We always, of course, with any of the organizations, nonprofits we work with, uh, ask their permission when we share any reference. So for the moment, not referenceable, however, if you saw Evo's slide earlier, you can go back to it with the NASCAR slide with a lot of organizations on it. Those are all nonprofits that are using AI or and or machine learning in some way today. And so that's organizations as large as the Nature Conservancy, new organizations that are just growing like Stop Soldier Suicide, and across you'll see all different mission areas. And Be the Match National Marrow Donor Program is, of course, in the health space, Stop Soldier Suicide, mental health. Um, and, and suicide prevention, major conservancy, all of those. And so as you see, Heart, American Heart Association, um, there's a number of organizations, again, all over in terms of size. It really depends on the use case um, that you have for AI and ML. It doesn't solve for everything, but if with the right use case, it can be a very powerful tool. And so we certainly have on our website, which is our AWS nonprofits website, a number of case studies and use cases around AI. We have a nonprofit blog that does the same. And certainly you can reach out to us directly via our website and we can go into much more detail about um, the various uses of AI and case studies that exist, um, and as well as the use cases in, in deeper in yours in terms of generative AI. Um, Evo, did you wanna add anything to that before I move on? No, I, th I think that was exactly right. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, this one's from Tom again. Thank you for all the questions, Tom. What metrics do you have published on the accuracy of Code Whisperer and your other models? Let me pull this slide up here. I didn't show it in the terms of, of speed. Um, so uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but we did have some metrics around that. Um, so we did a preview. We did some challenges and some, some examples because a lot of this also relies on how the actual users use the code whisper by actually typing uh, um, useful and correct uh, uh, prompts to actually generate that code. Uh, what we found is that uh, participants who used code whisper are 27% more likely to complete tasks successfully. Uh, I know that's not 100% your question. Uh, I don't have a specific stat on actual code accuracy, and I'll see if I can find that for you. All right, and last one. Does AWS, AWS integrate with other systems, such as QuickBooks Online? Is there a donor management component? Are there other demos or support if we are interested in joining AWS? Right. So um, to answer that, there is, we have a large ecosystem of partners and we basically partner with pretty much every company out there. Um, and we build a lot of integrations and customers build integrations with AWS. Right. So AWS is more than just SageMaker. It is uh, the virtual machines, it's databases, it's, all, it's 200 plus services. And all these services we are, what we do is really interconnect all these services with your existing uh, systems that might still be not in the cloud, they might still be in your own data center. 
Um, so we have a huge expertise in building these integrations. Yeah, and so, so yeah. Right. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go and on. to add to that point, there's a service called AppFlow, which helps build those connectors from your solutions to the cloud if they're not on the cloud today. But for example, a lot of those connectors already exist. The Salesforce connector already exists for all of their capabilities. The Black BlackBot has a number of connectors, for example, if that's a tool that you use. And so the connectors, some of them are pre-built, some of them need to be built depending on the situation, but all of that is possible. Integration is absolutely possible and it's frankly recommended because that's how you get your data all in one place. And then you can really take advantage of capabilities beyond even the platforms and software you're using, whether it's analytics, um, and other types of capabilities, QuickSight to do visualization and really create that one source of truth for your organization where you can tap that data with the right permissions um, as you need to, to look at it for different reasons. The CFO might have a different reason and question of that data than your fundraising team. And so that really, really bringing all that data in one place is a highly effective way to create insight um, for your organization to make data-driven decisions. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one point to that, Lauren. So uh, my role is a solution architect. So apart from doing webinars every now and then, really my role is to talk to our customers, um, to make them, help them integrate all these solutions and make them, ha have them make sense of all our solutions. So um, I'm not sure who you're with, um, but please reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to set up a conversation with the solution architect that, um, that covers your uh, your specific company or domain. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Evo. And then for those of you, I know a number of people, and there was also kind of a question in here about training and capability. And so I will say that we have a, a ton of free digital training of, on a variety of AI, of course, but everything from foundational, what is the cloud, all the way up to really advanced use cases. So absolutely recommend checking that out. And again, the partner network is super, super important. We absolutely understand that nonprofits are change the world companies and they're not always deep technologists and that's okay. That's why we have cultivated a really great network of organizations that are dedicated to supporting nonprofits and helping build that capacity. And that's what we help with as well. To Evo's point, our solution architects are here to create that guidance. And in talking with the solution architects, based on what you're trying to do, they are really a great resource to help you figure out that journey. What training should you take? What partners are good to engage with so you don't have to do it out there all by yourself? It's really, we serve as a trusted advisor in that capacity uh, so you can get to the right place quicker. This was so excellent. Uh, super, super informative. I mean, wow. I'm looking forward to the next one. And I'm not just saying that this was a lot. I learned a lot. Um, very different from your previous webinars. Um, just they just keep building and building and building. So if you if you miss a previous AWS webinar, go to our YouTube channel, TechSoup YouTube channel. And I know some people here may not have been um, technically as savvy, but this is the direction that the world is going to. So I know this webinar is going to be super helpful for you, if not today, then in the future. And we look forward to um, having the AWS come back again. Tom, I mean, uh, Lauren uh, Larkin, any last words? Evo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we are happy to talk more, I, to reach out. I know that has been a question. Go to our AWS Nonprofits website. There's a start a conversation link that will come right to us and our team um, who will understand what you're looking to do and get you to the right people who can provide that guidance. Awesome. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.